Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert, and welcome to the Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And I'm very honored today to be able to welcome a guest, Professor Jim Doty uh, from the University of Stanford, who is a really major uh, maker and shaker in the world of compassion and bringing compassion into the world. So let me tell you a little bit about him before we begin the actual interview. So James is an adjunct professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University of Medicine and the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, in other words, CCARE at Stanford. Um, his, one of the patrons of this organization is His, Holy, is, his Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is a founder benefactor. He works with a variety of scientists from a number of disciplines examining the neural basis for compassion and altruism. Through CCARE, Dr. Dodi has overseen the development of a variety of techniques, apps, and programs to address issues of mental health, stress, anxiety, and burnout. He's also the founder and CEO of Happy, 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 which is by H-A-P-P-I dot A-I. It's a healthcare company focused on creating a digital platform that uses artificial intelligence combined with a human avatar to treat mental health issues. He is also the senior editor of the Oxford Handbook of Compassionate Science. Dr. Doty is an inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, and has given support to charitable organizations supporting peace initiatives, funded health clinics throughout the world, created programs for the disabled, and supported programs for adolescents who are affected by AIDS and HIV. He has supported research, provided scholarships, and endowed chairs at multiple universities. He is presently focusing on developing educational programs for children in through the K-12 grade, focused on compassion, empathy, and social emotional learning. He has two personal books. One is Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart, which was a New York Times bestseller and has now been translated into 40 languages and editions. It has also served as the basis for the third album, Love Yourself, Tear, by the famous K-pop group, PTS. I'm not kind of into this well, but um, Jim obviously is, as you can see. He is presently completing his next book, Magic Mind, The Neuroscience of Manifestation and How It Changes Everything, which will be published in the fall of 2022, which is maybe this year. Dr. Doji is on the board of a number of nonprofit and organizations and is former chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation and the former vice chair of the Charter for Compassion. He is also an advisor to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex Archwell Foundation. Dr. Doty's work has been cited in numerous media, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NBC, ABC, and many others. He speaks around the world on the neuroscience and health benefits of compassion. So <laughs> I can't uh, say, I don't think there are many people who can claim as, have done as much as you have, Jim, for the cause of compassion. And so it's an absolute delight to welcome you to today's interview. And to start off, really, to just get a little bit of personal background about how did you get into compassion? What led you to your interest in compassion? Well, before I answer that question, just let me thank you for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. And um, um, it's very kind of you because I, I look at you as really a, uh, a huge uh, uh, personality and uh, proponent of compassion. So uh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Well, uh, to answer your question, <clears throat> like all of us, uh, who we are today is a manifestation of our past. And whether that be for good or bad, um, just to give you a little background of my story and actually you mentioned my book, Into the Magic Shop, which is really a memoir that incorporates contemplative practice and uh, neuroscience. So I had a challenging background. I grew up actually in poverty. Uh, my family was on public assistance my entire childhood. My father um, was an alcoholic, uh, a binge drinker, actually. And my mother uh, had had a stroke when I was a child and was partially paralyzed, had a seizure disorder and unfortunately was chronically depressed, uh, which led to multiple suicide attempts. And as you can imagine, uh, growing up in that environment is very challenging. As a child, uh, 
our um, <clears throat> environment very much shapes who we are. And uh, of course, for me, being in that situation uh, at that time led to a sense of uh, despair, hopelessness, uh, anger. And um, as you well know, there's this uh, area of psychology which focuses on children in these environments. And within that, they've developed this rating system called ACEs, uh, which is essentially uh, determines, depending on your ACE score, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, uh, actually uh, whether you will have, if you will, a successful future in terms of being able to hold a job, uh, being free of drug and alcohol abuse or mental illness. And for children who have higher ACE scores, the likelihood of them having a quote unquote successful life uh, rapidly diminishes as the score gets higher. So of course the question is what happened to me that uh, pushed me in a different direction? And before I answer that, I'll make another statement, uh, which is when children grow up in challenging or difficult environments, oftentimes they go in one or of two directions. The one direction is that they understand, of course, what suffering is. They observe not only their own suffering, but the suffering of others. And as a result, it makes them much more empathetic, kind, and thoughtful because, of course, they can put themselves in the position of another. And, of course, no one likes to be in that position. So they have a tendency to look at the others oftentimes as themselves. The other direction people can go, unfortunately, is that they can take the perspective that, uh, yes, I suffered, <clears throat> I survived, uh, I did it myself, uh, I don't owe anyone anything, and um, since I suffered, uh, everyone should suffer. And so they're much more callous and less thoughtful about the suffering of others because they put it into the context of, well, I suffered and therefore you should suffer, which is really sad and unfortunately also makes up a large percentage of people who come from these backgrounds. But what changed my life ultimately was actually walking into a magic shop when I was 12. And uh, I had had an interest in magic as a result of my father actually. <clears throat> and when I would uh, uh, get upset uh, or let's say uh, things were happening in my household that I wanted to avoid, oftentimes I would get on my orange stingray bike and ride as far and as fast away from that situation. And in this particular instance, that's what had happened. And I uh, ended up at a strip mall. We call those in the United States. I don't know what they call them in the UK, but it's a small collection of stores that are <clears throat> contained within a series of shops. And in, um, in this situation, there was a magic shop there and I walked in. Now, the interesting thing was the owner was not there, but his mother was there. And she was this somewhat rotund lady with long wavy gray hair. And she was reading a book and her glasses uh, were at the end of her nose held by a chain around her neck. And uh, <clears throat> she looked up and she greeted me with this extraordinary radiant smile. And as you well know, depending on how someone greets you or interacts with you, it sets the tone for the entire conversation. And the very nature of her doing that and having the sense of openness and anticipation and being interested really uh, sort of set the stage for, if you want to use the term psychological safety for me, because oftentimes I was fearful and angry, which of course stimulates your uh, flight, fight, or freeze response. But she was so kind and, and gentle and nice and open that I immediately felt comfortable and this led to her and I having a dialogue. And fundamentally, it was that dialogue and my ultimate interaction with her over a six week period uh, that changed the trajectory of my life. That's extraordinary. And I think also a great message of hope, really, isn't it? I mean, you know, the idea that even though children can be subjected to some of the horrors that you were, nevertheless, corrective emotional experiences like one you receive from the lady in the magic shop can do fundamental things. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? That just six weeks, you know, against a, a lifelong of, of, of abuse and trauma 
And yet somehow that switched something on in you, didn't it? It, it changed the way you saw the, the world and other people. Well, I think that's right. What happens, I think, um, in those situations is that uh, the nature of these types of traumas, which, as you know, uh, ultimately will end up uh, resulting in post-traumatic stress disorder, which, you know, we so often attribute to veterans, but it happens to children as well. But uh, um, yeah, I think that if there is one person in your life who gives support, encouragement uh, to you, uh, it may not make it perfect or wash away every one of those traumas, but it does make you understand the potential and the possibilities and the idea of uh, realizing that your future is not set by your past. And I think that a lot of people get stuck in that notion because they continue to carry their childhood trauma on their back. And that unfortunately influences every action that they take in the future. So at some point she must have triggered in you something that you are worth valuing, you are worth listening to, you are worth being close to. And that's a very important message for children who come from your background, because often they feel that, of course, then they're, they're not of value. So, and, and of course, you've played that out in your life, I think, which is very interesting of being trying to be of value to the world, haven't you? So that sense of here was somebody who saw value in you, and that set something going in you. And then off you go, and later you study to be a doctor and so forth. Well, I, well, I think that's right. And I, I think uh, what you're talking about is maintaining someone's dignity. When you take someone's dignity away, you're, you're absolutely correct. I, I mean, there is this sense of worthlessness. And in fact, uh, myself, prior to this, uh, I was becoming a, gener a juvenile delinquent. And the reason is because if no one cares about your future, why should you care about your future? And unfortunately, uh, it's a horrible, uh, if you will, reality. Uh, but uh, it's one that plays itself out uh, so often because uh, if you don't have any self-worth, then all the other things that are going on are irrelevant to you. And uh, oftentimes we end up actually beating ourselves up because we carry this negative perspective about who we are. So uh, over that six week period, uh, she taught me um, several things. Uh, one, the first one was I had not realized that when you come from these types of backgrounds, um, your sympathetic nervous system, uh, this flight, fight, or freeze response is chronically engaged at some level because uh, it's like in a war zone. If your life is chaotic, uh, there's no structure, you never know what's going to happen. As a result, you're always on the lookout wondering uh, uh, you know, when the sky is going to fall on you. And as a result, when you're so focused on that, it's extraordinarily difficult to uh, see what's actually happening around you because what you're doing is you're trying to portend the future, which results in you not being in the present. And it's very hard if in that situation to learn and to attend. So the first technique she taught, and you have to remember this was in the late sixties. Uh, this was before we talked about mindfulness or meditation or neuroplasticity. Uh, the first thing she taught me was a relaxation technique, which as you know, is now, a standard portion of uh, quote unquote mindfulness as described by John Cabot Zinn. So she taught me to start at my toes, go to the top of my head uh, to relax my body. And uh, also she taught me a breathing exercise. And of course, uh, as many listeners know, the very nature of doing a, a slow inhale and a slow exhale will shift you to engagement from your sympathetic nervous system to your parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to be much more um, open, which allows you access to your executive control areas in your brain, which make for much more thoughtful and discerning decisions. And also uh, the reality is it makes you much more uh, creative and productive because when you're in that mode, uh, you're not afraid, you're not anxious, uh, you're relaxed and frankly, your physiology works its best. So this ability to shift 
uh, has a profound, profound effect. And it allows you then to attend and be present. So that was uh, the first technique. And this, if you will, breathing practice uh, allowed you to attend. And then the third thing she taught me was the reality that the negative dialogue that so often goes on in our head, we think it's truth. We think it actually is the ba uh, based on fact. And of course, it's not. As you know, it's uh, negative commentary on some level from an evolutionary point of view uh, protects us because it attunes us to threat. But uh, oftentimes uh, the way it gets interpreted, especially in modern society, is a commentary about our worthlessness, that we're not worthy, that we don't belong, that we uh, are imposters. And uh, many, many people, if not everyone, carries that to some extent. It's just how powerful that narrative, how loud that voice is that actually can limit you in your ability to um, uh, be your best self, if you will. And then uh, from that, uh, she taught me, if you will, how to visualize or manifest uh, things that I wanted. And essentially the culmination of that six week period uh, really did change the trajectory of my life because I believed uh, that anything was possible. Yeah, I mean, you see, from my point of view, and we've talked about this from an evolutionary point of view, I mean, we evolved from primates, and most primates have to be very wary of dominant, the dominant male, particularly, but not only dominant male, and uh, live a subordinate. So they have to keep their head down. They, if they get ideas above the station, they get injured, get whacked. So we have, a, we have these evolutionary mechanisms are really a voice in your head that says, it's too dangerous out there. You're a subordinate, live as a subordinate, you're worth nothing, keep your head down, keep your head down, keep your head down. So th those thoughts that we think are just real, actually there is a subordinate program, which is trying to keep you to you know, hide, hide in the corner so you don't get injured. And that's very important, particularly for people like yourself who have been injured, right? But so what's really interesting is the way in which because of the inputs of this uh, wonderful woman that she was able to turn that program off in you somehow and turn on this other program, which is actually, no, I don't need to live as a subordinate. I do have value. I can achieve things. I can do things. I can make a contribution. And so I think, you, you know, that's why your story is so inspiring, actually, Jim, because, you know, you came from that background and we can see how these inputs turn these mechanisms on and off in the brain. And if you can turn this more uh, affiliative orientation, sense of social safeness, um, then that does really open the mind to be able to achieve things and do things and make a contribution as you did. But so where, how did you move on from there? So after the leaving this, um, the orbit of this wonderful woman, what, what happened then? Well, it's interesting because, you know, our interaction lasted only six weeks and it uh, clearly had a profound effect. Uh, but um, I never saw her again after that, which is uh, unfortunate. I actually went back and amazingly, uh, it was probably six months later, the uh, strip mall had a fence around it. All the shops were closed and sure. it was like she never even existed, which is really strange, of course. Now, in the process of writing the book, I ended up hiring an investigator who looked into all of this, and it was all real in terms of the owner of the shop, the mother visiting. And in fact, I talked to her um, grandson. And sort of the interesting part of the story is that her grandson was actually supposed to uh, spend the summer with her at uh, the father's. The parents were divorced. And apparently, um, as I understand it, the parents got into an argument, the mother refused to send the son. And in some ways, uh, I ended up being um, perhaps the surrogate for her grandson, uh, which is uh, quite interesting, of course. But in terms of your question, one of the things I realized is the ability of humans to intuit emotional states of others. And what I mean by that is whether it's through voice intonation, whether it's through facial expression, body habitus, even smell, people are highly attuned to the emotional states of others. And of course, uh, you know, the evolutionary construct of that of a mother taking care of her offspring. But uh, 
uh, what I found was that when I changed my attitude and my worldview, it also changed how people reacted to me. And mm -hmm. that really changed everything. Because if you walk around with anger and hostility, it impacts how you interact with the world. And uh, people don't want to be around you. So uh, I changed. And I changed to being much more kind to myself and giving myself self affirmations. But the other thing that happened is I changed how I looked at the world. Because if your view of yourself is chronically hypercritical, if you're always tearing yourself down, then you look at the world through the lens of hypercriticality, and you have a tendency to uh, tear people down and not have insight or self-awareness that everyone is suffering on some level. And as a result, if you're able to change that perspective, you look at people through a much more kinder, uh, thoughtful lens and are much less judgmental. And in fact, what happened was I used to have an immense amount of anger and hostility towards my parents because I felt that they had let me down, that they had hurt me, et cetera. But what I realized was that they were damaged people themselves and they did not have the tools to help themselves. And of course, the result can uh, uh, be uh, addiction, as the case with my father to alcohol in this instance, or a lead to chronic uh, depression, because you can't respond to the negative commentary in your head and you begin to believe it. So I forgave them and no longer had hostility to either my parents or, or actually to my situation. Instead of wishing what it could be or focusing on what had happened, I just accepted that this is the way it is, but it doesn't have to be the way it has to be in the future. And that insight, uh, again, changed my entire uh, perspective and allowed me to move forward without carrying the, bag uh, the baggage of anger and hostility, which again, uh, affects everything uh, in your life. So that's, I mean, those are very radical changes. I mean, many people, I mean, I've been a clinician for many years, many people would find those quite tough, quite difficult changes to, to make, you know, forgiving your parents for abuse and things like that. So that must have been quite a journey for you. Well, of course, nothing is instantaneous and nothing's necessarily perfect. Uh, uh, I think that when you have these types of traumas, and I'm not trying to in any way imply that mine by any measure are the worst. And in fact, uh, you know, poverty certainly has an impact, but you know, as well as I do, you can become or you can come from the most affluent background and still be highly, highly damaged from neglect, uh, from uh, abuse. And so it's cer certainly not necessarily always associated uh, with poverty in any way. But uh, um, yes, th that insight and self-awareness uh, did come and it was at a very early age, but it was not perfect. And what I mean by that is uh, throughout my life, uh, and actually she had had me make a list of 10 things that I wanted for my future. And I was 12 or 13. And of course, uh, you know, what do you want? Well, you want to have money. You want to live in a big house. You uh, want to drive a nice car. You want to, um, uh, in my case, I wanted to become a doctor. And uh, uh, so I wrote all of those down. But the problem was that I did not have enough self-awareness um, and I wasn't mature enough to process the difference between how many of us in society perceive quote unquote success for, or, or happiness because we equate oftentimes societal success uh, resulting in or being equivalent to happiness. And so while I was never uh, bad or mean in any way, I, though, was focused on trying to 
if you will, repair or hide the damage that uh, was a result of my childhood, which was based on insecurity, fear, shame, and uh, judgment. And so while, uh, yes, uh, what Ruth taught me allowed me to believe that I could go to college or uh, medical school or become a neurosurgeon, et cetera, what I realized ultimately, and we, we can talk about why, but what I realized ultimately was that Every time I uh, rose to the top of whatever it was uh, in terms of accomplishing something, uh, it never filled the emptiness that I had or the insecurity. And so I would try, okay, well, if I just do this now, I'll be accepted and the shame will, will go away. And of course, that never happened. And here uh, at some point, I've been a successful entrepreneur. I'm living in a penthouse, I have Porsches, Ferraris, I'm dating beautiful women, I was single at the time, yet I was never more miserable than I had been in my entire life. Yeah, I mean, that's such an important point, isn't it, that, you know, when you come from these, well, even just in our societies, there is a sense in which we, our sense of security and safeness is created by our material wealth and social status, you know, if I can get some status, then that gives me some so it's a safety seeking as you would say a safety seeking process but the problem with safety seeking is it doesn't actually provide you what you need which is social connectedness i mean what's interesting for me is that through all of that behind all of that there's still this real um drive if i can put it like that to be a value to make a contribution to because it turns up doesn't it, it comes later with this this real interesting compassion which is about the, 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 the strong desire to address suffering and alleviate suffering. So through all of this searching for status, searching for safeness, there is nevertheless underneath that, this constant light that seems to be directing you for how you can make a contribution, how you can address suffering in the world. Well, I wish I you know, had some incredible insight into that driver. Uh, because it's, sometimes it's fucking annoying because I'd like to be rich and famous. But <laughs> even more uh, rich and famous. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, uh, I don't have any uh, direct self awareness of why that is important to me. Uh, it just is, and I, I wish I had some more clarity. But I, what I will tell you, though is I think part of it has to do with a clear, constant sense of the nature of suffering of other people. And what happens uh, when I feel that way, of course, uh, it reminds me of my own suffering. And, uh, and the realization, as with Ruth, each and every one of us has the ability to positively impact another person's life and you don't have to be wealthy you don't have to be successful you simply have to care and uh, this deep realization that uh, that is truth really uh, in many ways inspires me because uh, even uh, as an example of you know from my own trajectory I've given many talks uh, about you know the lessons I've learned and, and also through the book, and have gotten responses really from all over the world about the inspiring nature of that narrative and how it has allowed people to believe that they can change their own lives. And obviously, I'm a neurosurgeon and a physician, and my, the very nature of my job is one of compassion. But in that world, of course, I can only help one person at a time. And while it's wonderful, and I feel very pr privileged and blessed to be in that position, the reality is if you can uh, create inspiring narratives to share with people and make them understand uh, the power within themselves, because in some ways, unfortunately, when you lose your dignity, when you are discarded, of course, you feel you have no agency, you feel you have no power. And what I suggest to people is that when you stop beating yourself up, when you start stop listening to the external narratives also about 
uh, judgments people make about your possibilities, then actually this liberates you. Uh, because when you realize your own value, when you realize the false narratives of so many of these things, suddenly you realize that within you uh, is extraordinary power, not only to change yourself, but to change others. Um, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned the second book I'm writing, uh, The Neuroscience of Manifestation. Uh, I mean, literally the first sentence says, the universe doesn't give a fuck about you. And I, I, uh, I read <laughs> and the and the reality is what I mean by that. And I, this is not to uh, disparage people of faith, uh, but uh, God also says uh, uh, you must help yourself. And in some ways, this idea that within you is the power to help yourself, I think, is uh, revelatory for for so many people who don't understand that. So if I can uh, run around the world and promote that narrative and empower people and make them believe in, believe in themselves or, or the books I've written can do that, then that's much, much more uh, powerful in terms of if you're simply looking at who you can impact. And so in some ways, that's why I've actually stopped doing neurosurgery and now I'm uh, focused on uh, providing uh, inspiration, as well as uh, tools and uh, techniques to um, liberate people in some ways. Yeah, I just want to, you know, that part of you, that that angry young man, you know, because I think sometimes we forget that what can drive compassion is a real sense of anger that the world is the way it is, you know. Um, <clears throat> one view I mean, as you know, in the Buddhist tradition, they see life as full of suffering because we are just here and we come into existence and we grow a little bit and then we decay and we die. The whole process is pretty miserable at some level. And there is a sense in which, you know, what the fuck? I mean, you know, life has to eat life. Are you serious? I mean, who created this pile of shit, right? So there's a part of one which is, no, 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 this must not happen. This must not continue. And if we can do anything to stand against that nature of suffering, then so we will do that. So I think sometimes, you know, because I've come from a tricky background, sometimes there is an anger. It should not be like this. I do not want it to be like this. I do not want people to suffer. You know, I will stand against suffering. Well, I think you're exactly right. And in fact, in my book, I, I think repeatedly use the statement, this is unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, and I think, that's right. Uh, I think that uh, you must stand up. Now, of course, the challenge for many people is that, especially based on their background, if every time you stand up, you get smacked, it's not something you really want to do that <laughs> often. Uh, uh, and I think that most people have a fear, either a fear of taking the first step to liberate themselves or the fear that if they stand up, they're just going to be smacked down again. And I think this is why, you know, if we look at the hero's journey, we look at how people have responded in different types of crises, uh, most people will bend to that authority and uh, because uh, there's a price to pay. But at some point, you have to uh, accept the fact that the price of your own dignity is worth standing up for and uh, be prepared uh, for the price you may have to pay. And uh, that has been uh, my repeated belief. And as you recall, uh, in my book, I talked about this uh, example of watching a child get bullied by the individuals who were bullying me. And at, at some point in that instance, I finally stood up. And the reality was when I stood up to the bully and looked him in the eye, I saw the same <clears throat> fear and insecurity in his eyes. And again, it, in some ways, it gets back to how people act out, how people deal with their own suffering. 
when you when you're suffering and you strike out at others it's not necessarily because you want to hurt people specifically you're striking out at the your own pain that you don't know how to get rid of and that's why <clears throat> Again, uh, we have a tendency to look at people and make judgments, judgments about their actions, judgments about how they're dressed, judgments about how they speak, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't appreciate that a person's actions when uh, in the moment oftentimes have no relationship to what's going on in the moment, but our reactions to the baggage, the pain, that they're carrying. And this is the only way they know how to react. And so when you have that same gentleness of perspective, and as uh, you've heard, I'm sure this idea of between stimulus and response, there is a pause. And within that pause lies your freedom. You know, I think that as a species, we are uh, highly attuned to threat. And when somebody comes forward to us aggressively, uh, our natural tendency is to respond aggressively or to run away. But if you're more thoughtful, if you teach yourself to not make that snap judgment, if you teach yourself not to allow your sympathetic nervous system to be engaged, because of course that's put you uh, essentially on a path of survival without access to thoughtful discerning judgment, then uh, bad things often will happen, or at least the things you don't want to have happen versus uh, being more calm, thinking through uh, and understanding the various drivers for people's behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important point you, you make. I mean, what, I, what I'm wanting to kind of steer you around to is your mission if you like I mean one of the things that has always struck me about you very very strong sense of mission of bringing compassion into the world this is something that's really is uh, very very powerful within you and so I mean how is that going I mean how is how are you manifesting that sort of real drive to bring compassion into the world well I think one of the most important things any of us can do is to be authentic, an authentic human being. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that it's always interesting to watch, uh, you know, as an example, scientists go on these platitudes about their research, and you can make that argument probably <laughs> us on some level, but uh, underneath this is this, um, uh, deep sense of the importance of uh, understanding compassion and how to give that gift to everyone. Uh, for me, um, from obviously a personal perspective, this has allowed me to survive and thrive. But I also clearly understand that everyone has this ability within them, if you can unleash it, if you will. And um, so you want to be like the woman in the magic, the magic. Show of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to dress like her. And uh, <laughs> well, I, I think uh, all of us want to be like that. You know, if as, as an example, I'm sure you've experienced when you've given a lecture, someone will come up to you and go, oh my God, you changed my perspective of the world. You know, I'm going to go forward and uh, promote the same message because it's so powerful and because it changed them. Uh, I feel extraordinarily blessed to be in the position to do that. And you're right. I, I mean, that is my mission. And I think by, well, look, the science is extraordinarily important. Uh, I think though, Frankly, uh, we don't have to push that narrative because every bit of evidence is so strong to mm. uh, support the power of compassion, self-compassion uh, to change someone's life. But what hasn't been uh, done uh, as well as I think we could uh, is to translate that message into uh, doable actions that allow someone to overcome their own 
uh, self-created limitations or to, if you will, break themselves out of the prison that they created for themselves. And so in my own little way, whether it's be giving a talk or writing a book, if I can, if you will, liberate one person, uh, I feel very uh, blessed and fortunate uh, to be able to do that. I mean, in some ways, it's like being a doctor uh, and saving someone's life. And I'm sure for you, as an example, if you've prevented somebody from committing suicide, uh, you are, uh, you feel so overwhelmed with thankfulness and the gratitude that sh actually you're able to be in that position. Yeah. But you see, what I'm sort of constantly digging for, if you want, <laughs> extraordinary drive you have for bringing it into the world. I mean, you know, not only your books, but setting up sea care, going around the world and trying to get various uh, organizations to come together and so on and so on. I mean, a, a huge amount of energy for this mission that you're on is just sort of tapping into that immense dream that you have really to, to try to bring um, compassion into the world, not just to you know, release people from their, their suffering, but also to create a world where we can be more compassionate to each other. No, I, I think you're right. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is uh, you simply have to look uh, in the news. I, I mean, you know, we have essentially the genocide occurring in the Ukraine. We have the ongoing crisis in Yemen. We have the suffering in Syria. We have uh, the actions in uh, South Sudan. We have the actions in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. We have uh, horrible poverty and suffering uh, in the first world, specifically the United States. And, you know, it is so hard uh, for me, <clears throat> you know, to see all of these things happening and then reflect on the fact that we have effectively all the resources necessary to alleviate all of that suffering. And that's what's uh, uh, so sad about this, you know, as an example, in the United States, you look at the amount that's spent on um, defense, quote unquote, or if you will, the military industrial complex. And, uh, you know, the United States spends what, six times more than the other nine uh, leading industrialized countries in the world on defense. I mean, how ridiculous. Uh, if you took three or four days of the resources that are expended for, for defense, you could alleviate poverty. Uh, in the United States, you could uh, offer housing uh, to veterans or to everyone. You could make sure there's not a single child who goes hungry, much less uh, creating wars of which no one wins other than an individual's ego. And the pain of, of that realization uh, is almost overwhelming. And so again, um, being able to give people, um, if you will, the gift of their own um, dignity and making them realize that within them, uh, they hold immense power to move forward in a kind, positive way. While uh, the nature of our history is such that uh, certainly I recognize uh, that my impact may be uh, very limited, but at least uh, it's a positive impact uh, that I can make. And I think all of us at the end of our days, uh, it's not about, as you well know, uh, how many cars you have or how big of a house you live in. It's about <clears throat> meaning and purpose. And if you can lead a life of meaning and purpose, while it may not translate in traditional um, definitions of happiness, if you're talking about deep, sustained feelings of, uh, of uh, a caring for others, which I would say fundamentally is happiness, then I think uh, it's a wonderful uh, place to be. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, because you, you know, we know, as you well know, that when you operate from that position, the way your brain is, the way your immune system is, it all works much better than when you're in a threat focused. But it does bring up an issue in terms of creating a compassionate world is how do you affect the people 
in positions of power who are still very, very threat focused. I mean, there's, there's a basic view that I can only feel safe if I'm stronger than you. I can only feel safe if I can threaten you more than you can threaten me. That is a world view in some areas. And how do we create a world where people think, no, no, I can feel safe if we can learn to trust each other, if we can learn to care for each other, if we can have respect for each other, that's the better way to feel safe. But how can we uh, get that much more of a compassionate orientation to try to help us deal with our threat? Because we are obviously threatened by each other, but we've got to find a new, a different way of dealing with our sense of threat for each other. Well, I, I think um, here's, of course, the problem. When you have uh, people who are threat-oriented or insecure, if you will, uh, um, they will oftentimes do anything to at least have that false sense of security. And that means doing horrendous things. Uh, I, we've talked about this before, you know, none of us uh, chose uh, the families we were born into or our genetic makeup. And uh, there are a lot of people who are threat focused. Um, and uh, how do you change that? I think the other part of that is that people who are, if you will, more compassion focused, more outwardly oriented to improve the world, they oftentimes are not um, mean or manipulative uh, people. And so, you know, you have this interesting struggle between the insecure threat oriented people who will mobilize any resource uh, to deal with what their what is their perceived threat, while on the other hand you have nice, kind people who have a tendency to sit there and say, "Let's continue to work on this. Let's continue to have these conversations." And it's an interesting paradox because, of course, in many instances, that leaves those people the least likely to fight or put up resistance because they're always trying to find compromise or ways not to inflict pain on others. And this is something I struggle with. Uh, as an example, if you look at uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, as an example, the reality is based on his history that manifested over many years, is that you know he's one of the most uh, horrible, uh, ruthless dictators around. Well, how do you have a conversation with someone like that other than you have a knife at their throat with a realistic uh, belief that you will slit their throat if they don't act according to certain rules. <laughs> and unfortunately, there is a significant uh, subset of people who are in power in, uh, as an example, countries uh, which have this uh, threat authoritarian narrative. The other side of it too is that unfortunately, uh, and we sort of hit on this a little earlier, is most people have a naive belief that if they just go along with the authoritarian person, uh, that it'll be okay, that they'll be okay. And potentially, they're willing to sacrifice many others for this false notion uh, that uh, they'll be taken care of. And, you know, it's interesting, interesting, as an example, the United States, you have a whole group of people who are willing to believe the lies of an authoritarian uh, person who ideally would like to be a dictator. Uh, and they're willing to sacrifice integrity, uh, position, everything for a lie, because this person, uh, first of all, promotes an, a narrative that it's us against them and then implies that if they follow him, they'll be safe. And of course, as he has de repeatedly demonstrated, he'll throw anybody under the bus, no matter how loyal you are, which is even more fascinating to watch how many people continue to follow the person. And so uh, the psychology of people, uh, unfortunately, through our long, long evolution, uh, oftentimes uh, dictates uh, how they will act in the present. Yes, see, I think this is a fascinating thing about how 
the science of compassion is beginning to change because you know we've talked about your life story about the things that happened to you and how you gain new insights and belief in yourself and how you took that then into bringing compassion became a doctor and so forth what's now emerging is that compassion is not about just being helpful to ourselves but also about how do we take on the dark side you know we need compassion to be able to do the difficult things not just the, the those other sort of emotional things which is how do you prevent the dark side from constantly grabbing the attention of the human mind because it has for thousands of years i mean we have butchered each other for thousands of years we've tortured each other for thousands of years there's something fundamentally wrong with the way in which our minds are constructed and compassion is a way of turning that off but the big issue and i know you're very driven by this as well is how do we get that into the populations at sufficiently high level, like a meme or a virus, that actually begins to swamp out these other dimensions of these high threat focused, often males, who just want to come in and grab power and then threaten everybody and make themselves feel you know, insecure by their ability to be threatening. I mean, I think compassion, you know, compassion is not this weak. Um, uh, sort of softy thing. It's actually a very courageous, wise approach to address the dark side in our in our minds, in our societies, and in our history. No, I think that's right. I, I think that, uh, uh, as an example, in my own situation, uh, I have no problem being on stage and having my voice cracked and or, or shed a tear and show my own emotion. And the interesting thing about that is that when you do that, that allows the audience if you will, to touch themselves and feel their own emotion. And of course, this has to do with authenticity and uh, um, being open and no longer fearing judgment. I think uh, Thich Nhat Hanh would often say, you know, you can't have a lotus without the mud. And on some level, uh, the mud is our dark side or our shame. Uh, and uh, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, the other paradox is, and I think, uh, what was the name of it? Uh, there, there was a cartoon uh, movie, but it, it showed a world where everything was perfect, where everyone just lounged around. They had no fears. They had all the food they could eat, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, you know, these people got, fat, lazy, and had no particular purpose in life. And so it's, it's this weird paradox. If everything is perfect, then you're not happy necessarily either. And so I think in an ideal world, there is, uh, and this is the nature of actually burnout, you know, there's enough um, challenges or, or stress that motivate you to overcome them but it's not so overwhelming uh, that it destroys you. And then you can uh, continue to move forward with a sense of satisfaction about overcoming reasonable challenges. It's when they overwhelm you and are chronic that you in some ways are destroyed. And uh, again, uh, transitory comfort of somebody telling you it's gonna be okay and creating a narrative of protection addresses in some ways, um, the part about your fears, uh, but of course, uh, oftentimes it's a very false nar narrative. I do think that if we are able on a high level, because it's like the nature of uh, repeated commentary, uh, if you repeat a lie long enough, you'll get a subset of people who uh, irrationally believe the lie. And uh, we see that, of course, in our own situation in the United States with this narrative about somehow the election was stolen. You know, the reality is the only person who's trying to steal the election is the guy who is making those statements. But, uh, uh, but uh, so if you have an, a constant negative narrative that creates the, uh, or incites the threat response, it's very hard to overcome that. And, there are two aspects of this. One is the nature of our media. Our media, uh, it, it's actually controlled by a very small number of companies and they don't make any money unless there's conflict because if everyone is fat and happy, uh, 
they're not buying tons of stuff or they're not responding by turning on their TV to see what the latest threat is. And of course, this is a very powerful false narrative uh, that makes people think that the world is shit and falling apart and creates stress and anxiety. The reality is that 95% of the people are good people who are either doing the right thing or at least not contributing to the destruction of civilization. Uh, yet we have this 5% of outliers, I think, on either end of the spectrum who uh, are driven by this narrative of power and control. Uh, but society would not survive if it was dominantly made up of people who are uh, so ego driven or so uh, insecure that they want to take and take and take. So I think one part is the media. I would suggest that if you can create a narrative that repeatedly over and over presents uh, to individuals in a practical sense, the power of compassion, then that will change a lot of people's mind. You just have to have the resources uh, to do that. And that's in some ways why I'm surprised by uh, a, a subset of the billionaire class who nominally are on the left side of the aisle in the sense that they believe in uh, the right of individuals to lead a happy, safe life, why they are not using their resources to promote this narrative over and over and over again on a very high level repeatedly, uh, which of course will not only affect those who are already bent in that direction, but will stop people to be more thoughtful about uh, the directions they're choosing. And this is what I don't understand. Uh, my repeated experience is that uh, 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 the significant majority of the billionaire class are only interested in themselves, protecting themselves and acquiring more resources, which of course tilts the dial uh, in a very negative way, because when they own all the resources, it means those resources are taken away from others. And if you are hungry, if you don't have a food, uh, if you don't have shelter, if you don't have security, of course, this leads to this constant engagement of your uh, sympathetic nervous system, which then allows you to sort of try to choose the most secure way to live versus uh, being in a position where you can look beyond those things and have decisions made without being affected by your threat mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such an important point, isn't it? I mean, there's um, Dasha Keltner in your part of the world who sort of looked at some of these things. And the, the factor is that, that wealth tends to create its own demons. I mean, it's like the dragon that sits on all the gold and can't let it go. And the more you have, the more you're frightened of losing. We know from quite a lot of psychological studies that actually people are often more frightened of losing things than they are, than they, than they drive to gain things. So there's fear of losing and then you get caught up in this. So it's all very archetypal, but what we need is to help people become much more aware of these underlying archetypal evolved mechanisms driving them. They're not driving, they think they're driving their minds. No, they're not. They're being driven by these archetypes which have been throughout history, of course. And the other thing I'd like to say is one of the things that, from my point of view of compassion is that the is the issue of economity, you know, equ equanimity, I always pronounce that word wrong, but how compassion promotes that. So as soon as you get somebody saying, we will make you great, whether you're a political leader, whether you're a religious leader, be careful, be careful. That is a perfume poison, right? If you need to be great, think about what that is that's driving you, because what we really need is to be um, uh, adjust. We need to be equal. We need to be ensuring that I don't want to be great. I just want to be fair. All right. I don't want to be great. I want to be fair. So if we can get these messages that compassion is really about the creation of not to be intoxicated by the message of we will make you great. That's being used throughout history to make you drive you nuts. And then you go and kill all the other people just to make sure you are great. But we really want to drive for equality. That is the basis of compassion, right? So I think that side of compassion is beginning to come in now. And I mean, I think you've done a lot to kind of promote that as well. So 
before we wrap up, what I'd like to ask you now, because I know you're doing some fantastic work. I mean, how do you see the challenges in the future? What are your challenges, your personal challenges that you're you're wanting to take on? <clears throat> I think there are several. And one is how can we create, if you will, a constant beacon of hope uh, that um, constantly, loudly expresses that message. And I think it um, requires an entity, a government, if you will, uh, to help you carry that burden. And what I mean by that is, as an example, if you can imagine a country that says, uh, we're going to be the re global uh, <coughs> um, hub of compassion, if you will. And what I mean by that is imagine one of the things I think I've shared with you is this uh, creating a world compassion festival. Uh, and this brings together spiritual and religious leaders, recognizing that almost 80% of people have some sort of religious type of practice, uh, celebrities, which of course are followed by a large number of people, as well as musicians, artists, um, to not do a, we are the world or farm a type of thing, which lasts for a day, but essentially to put a stake in the sand that says these values of interdependence, of compassion, of a sense of our responsibility to the other are critically important to our survival. And you do this on a worldwide basis. As an example, you can imagine you have this World mm -hmm. Compassion Festival in one place, but imagine if you have uh, a thousand hubs throughout the world who are doing something similar, but you're all tied together. And as an example, uh, you use the hashtag One Act Paris, where you document acts of compassion, kindness, uh, whether by video, uh, photograph, uh, audio, uh, just uh, the written word, uh, and you uh, sort of feed all these into this major event and you document the love, the compassion, the openness that is fundamentally at the basis of our humanity around the world, the very nature of promoting that. And then underneath this, as an example, you create a metaverse, which allows uh, nonprofits, NGOs, um, uh, charities to sort of say, here's what we need to help uh, improve the world and it allows for chat, it allows for donations, it allows for volunteerism, and it's uh, aggregated and curated by, if you will, a uh, impartial party that because especially in the uh, millennial population or the Gen Z population, people do want to be of service. They see what is going on in the world. And if you give people the opportunity to be of service, I think people will move in that direction. And once they do it and they see the profound psychological benefit of that, they'll continue to do that. I think that's one thing. I think um, creating, if you will, a global uh, compassion prize, similar to the Nobel Peace Prize, where you recognize uh, the power of compassion and how the actions of an individual or group have had a profound effect on the world. And you highlight that, you emphasize that. I think that um, uh, as an example, uh, one thing uh, would be imagine an international uh, compassion core. What do I mean by that? You know, you look at the United States' Peace Corps uh, which was founded in the early 60s, which in some ways uh, was a reasonable approach, I think, where it was the first world, if you will, offering uh, uh, people to aid in the third world. And while I think that has been important, had some impact, I think the re reality is, though, a recognition that everyone in any country, whether it be first or third, has the potential to be of service to another uh, country. And what I mean by that is this breaks down the barrier of instead of looking down on another, it allows you to see eye to eye and say, we're all equal, we can all help, we can all be of service. And it doesn't have to be from the first world to the third. Frankly, uh, the insights that many people have in the third world can be quite beneficial. And it's interesting because we feel we have this need to... Uh, 
look at suffering countries, well, uh, frankly, in the United States, a mile from where I'm sitting are people who are homeless and in dire poverty. And, uh, you know, we don't have to go also, <laughs> on the one hand, it's wonderful to see the reality of the fact that everyone on some level in the world is suffering and to recognize that and use that, if you will, as a meme to understand our interdependence and our connection and the fact that we're all suffering. But it also brings, of course, uh, the reality that each of us uh, uh, doesn't have to go very far to be of service and to help others uh, as well. So, but I think the creation of this uh, uh, creates a cadre of people who uh, can be incredible uh, advertisements of the reality that all of us can help each other and uh, promote that narrative. And I think uh, marketing is extraordinarily powerful. You know, if you have the resources and in some ways to repeatedly promote this narrative, we know from different studies that have been done, when that narrative is proposed, in some ways, it's like uh, you're being given the option that you're reminded of to do the right thing, not the selfish thing. And, you know, studies have been done that show that if you, uh, uh, as an example, in certain stores, if you have a set of eyes that look at you, it decreases the risk of people uh, shoplifting. <laughs> and and uh, unfortunately, I think having this omniscient message repeated makes people uh, stop and pause and think about what they're doing. And I think all of that is within our power. Uh, you know, some people would say, you know, how could you get the United States to promote that narrative? And uh, sadly, unfortunately, and in, in oftentimes in democratic societies, especially the way in the United States, as an example, it's so politicized that if one subset of people or, or party agrees to something, it's not uh, sitting there reflecting, saying, you know, that's actually a good idea. I'm going to support it. The knee jerk reaction is to uh, immediately oppose it. So in some ways, this narrative, if you can get uh, a more <laughs> a benign dictatorship type of country uh, to support that narrative, uh, one that's committed to progress to improving the world, or at least you've been there will it definitely in that direction or system in that, I think that could uh, be extraordinarily powerful. Uh, but really, it's creating this overwhelming message of kindness, compassion, caring, love, interdependence that uh, I think will ultimately um, allow for our survival if we just promote the uh, uh, narrative repeatedly over and over and demonstrate by each of our own actions uh, the power of, of this ourselves. And as you know, once you do something kind for another and you have the uh, positive experience of that, then th that uh, starts changing your brain. So I think those are all potential options, but I have no illusions uh, to the fact that uh, in the real world, uh, there are some uh, forces, evil forces uh, that are selfish and greedy and at some point, uh, we do have to stand up to that and say, no, we will no longer stand for this. It is not acceptable. Passion is not necessarily uh, the statement, please walk on me and I'll thank you for it. Uh, compassion is saying, uh, these are my beliefs. We are here to be of service. In the United States, as an example, uh, you know, how much of the middle class must you destroy uh, before they rebel? I, I mean, you have a minimal wage uh, that doesn't even allow for one person to live. You have uh, essentially a broken social contract where somehow politicians, uh, or at least a significant number of them, don't believe in the obligation of the government to care for the poor, to care for uh, children, to feed children, to ensure that teachers are paid a fair wage. And this is in many ways contri contributing to the destruction of a society that fundamentally uh, wants to be compassionate because they see the actions of those in power to repeatedly take, 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 
and frankly, unfortunately, give uh, to corporate entities uh, who essentially pay them off. Now, I don't mean to go on a political diatribe here, but uh, this is reality. At some point, income inequality will uh, continue to the point where we must stand up and take our humanity back. I mean, from my point of view, the, the narrative that you're creating is to help people think about the they can be of service and to have a sense of community through the idea of being of service to reignite a positive view of what humans are capable of. Because, you know, frankly, we're all very cynical. You know, we've seen all of the political moves and so on and so on. And I think that's that's the important point in your vision, because, you know, we know that with all of these dictators, with all these political movements, the moment people stop supporting them, they die. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and again, and essentially almost every instance, right? I mean, yeah. we would not be here if uh, uh, any of them had survived. But again, unfortunately, what it takes, it takes, uh, you know, the house about to collapse before somebody says, holy shit. And then uh, it uh, results in a very, very powerful narrative uh, of the human spirit to have this vision of love, of kindness, of connection. And I think that is what each of our challenges is, is how do we ignite that in people? How do we walk the walk? Uh, and it's not to say that it's easy or the path is straight or they're not hills and valleys. It's just though the acceptance of that reality and uh, a view that if you do accept those challenges, the world will be a better place. And this is this idea of an other directed uh, view versus a more self-centered view. And this isn't to say, look, I, I like to live well. I uh, um, uh, certainly enjoy uh, different aspects of, uh, if you will, societal success. But that being said, as an example, someone was uh, uh, saying how great Trump was because, you know, uh, at least for a period of time, the economy was booming, uh, uh, the stock market was doing well. And he was saying, well, you know, uh, aren't you happy because your 401k, which is your retirement fund, has ballooned or that you're paying less taxes? And I, I, my statement is I would be happy to pay double my taxes. I have no problem at all. If we can create a, a, a just environment that allows people to be supported, feel that there's a social safety net, and we can care for each other, I have no problem giving 90% of my wealth away. And the, some, the selfish narrative that, uh, as you pointed out, well, it's all about me. How am I doing? It's not all about you. Because if it's all about you, that will lead to the destruction of our species. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the point, just to come back to your, your drive, <laughs> which is where we started this amazing drive to bring compassion into the world and highlighting the fact that, you know, it compassion is about addressing these political issues. It is about addressing the problems of the aspect that are in our minds, which can be inflamed, which is that we, once we have, we want more, once we have, we want more. And this tendency that I can only feel strong if you're weak. I think that's what compassion has to has to has to stand against. And what you're trying to do is setting up these hubs around the world, thinking of a festival. Is you're giving voice, you're giving a narrative that's really quite new in a way. This is a new narrative that can spread. But when people understand it and they understand why this can be so powerful, then I think people will flock. Well, we hope people will flock to it. But at the moment, as you point out, if we only have our right-wing media, there is no narrative of compassion. People don't know what it is. They think it's a bit soft, a bit woozy. They don't see the courage. They don't see the wisdom. They don't see the power of compassion. But the kind of work you're doing, I think, is to show this. It's like a bringing a beacon to the world. No, 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 this is compassion. It's about equality. It's about justice. It's about the other. It's about contribution. It's about being of service. I think that's such an important message. So one, my last question, because I've, I've held you for too long, you've been too fascinating. Um, how can people get involved? Well, uh, I think there are a myriad of ways to get involved. And again, uh, uh, oftentimes people have a sense that, well, I have to join this big organization or I have to do this huge act. 
uh, being involved, frankly, is as simple as being uh, making an effort to smile at people and be, be kind every day in your life. You know, you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be powerful. You don't have to, quote unquote, be successful. You can simply be a kind human being. Opening the door for another person, seeing someone who's hungry and buying them a meal, uh, uh, seeing uh, children who are hungry or uh, don't have shelter, reaching out in some way, making uh, donations to organizations. You know, I posted something on social media that it was a statement, uh, uh, you know, I feel helpless. You know, what can I do for the situation in the Ukraine? Well, you know, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, someone saying, okay, I'm leaving my home and I'm going to go fight on the front lines of the Ukraine, uh, which is much to ask. And I certainly uh, support people who may be making that decision. But, you know, um, there are a ton of uh, organizations that are on the ground, Doctors Without Borders, uh, the World, uh, um, what is it, uh, um, Kitchen, I, uh, Jose Andres's program, a whole variety of organizations that are trying uh, to be a benefit. So I think uh, being attuned, because the challenge is, is it's easy to forget. And I think if your orientation every day is to sit there and say, what is it that I can do to be of service? Is it uh, making a donation? Uh, is it working at the local uh, food kitchen? Is it collecting clothing for those uh, who are cold? Uh, uh, you know, I think all of these are important acts. And again, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to have a platform. You don't have to have immense power to do this. Everyone, every day uh, uh, has the ability to improve the life of at least one person. You know, it's interesting. I, I also posted something on social media and it was a, a, a picture of a young girl crying and in a war zone. And, uh, basically it said something like, uh, he asked her, are you a Hindu Muslim or Christian? And the little girl says, uh, I am hungry. So it's not about religion. It's about your humanity. And each of us every day has the ability to have a positive effect on our humanity. And so that's... Uh, I think says it all. Jim, it's been wonderful to take your time. Thank you so much. You've, we've covered so much ground from your background to how things change for you, to how you found a sense of purpose, to moving on through sea care, and now your new ambitions is to set up these hubs around the world. And first of all, I mean, long may you prosper and flourish. And we look forward to all the wonderful work you do. Thank you well, so much for your yes. Oh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. But I, I, I don't want to diminish in any way your own contribution to all of these areas. And, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, people like yourself uh, and the work that I'm doing really, I think, uh, is very, very powerful. And uh, um, we just have to hold hands, if you will, and understand we're all on the same path and not get locked into each of our needs, but a vision beyond ourselves. And I think uh, that uh, is uh, the power uh, that will actually make change. What a wonderful thought to say goodbye for, for now. Take care. Catch up with you later, Jim. Bye. Okay, my friend. Take care.